This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidoyot. It's Tuesday, September 3rd. This is Africa 54. Mozambique prepares for a historic visit from Pope Francis. Drone delivery startup Zipline takes flight in Ghana. And could accelerated research and development help the world eradicate malaria? We'll explain. Pope Francis is set to depart for Africa on Wednesday, where he kicks off a three-nation tour of the continent. His first stop is Mozambique. VOA's Anita Powell has this preview of the pontiff's visit from Maputo. Mozambique is putting on its best face for a historic papal visit. Maputo's main cathedral is eagerly preparing for Pope Francis's visit, the first since Pope John Paul II arrived in 1988 while Mozambique was in the throes of a brutal civil war. Leaders signed a new peace agreement earlier this year. Now the visit of uh, uh, Pope Francis is coming after the last agreement of peace. So it's, it's a kind of a blessing for all this period uh, of uh, talk uh, between the government uh, and the opposition. But also his words about uh, climate changing, environment poor, and living together, they will be a great message uh, for our country. And beyond. Sibyl Yilileneke drove seven hours from neighboring South Africa for the visit. I hope he's going to say there should be peace amongst the people of South Africa. And he's spreading a lot of love within the Christians. Although about one quarter of Mozambicans are Roman Catholic, those who are not of the faith say they'll also be paying attention. I think it's interesting. It would be very interesting to see him here in Mozambique. Okay, so I'm Muslim, but I think I should listen to him. And others say they're listening for a specific message. I hope he brings a message of peace because we need peace in this country. This is a part of second trip to Sub-Saharan Africa. He first visited in 2015, going to Kenya, Uganda, and the Central African Republic. On this tour, he'll also visit the island nations of Madagascar and Mauritius. Nina Paul, VOA News, Maputo. Gabo Delgado in northern Mozambique remains one of the country's poorest regions and the site of a little-known Islamist insurgency, which has been so in terror for close to two years. Philip Alfroy reports. Burnt out houses, food supplies reduced to ash, and villagers left hungry and fearing for their lives. For nearly two years now, the residents of the North Mozambican province of Cabo Delgado have been living in fear of attacks carried out by militant Islamists. They came out of nowhere and burnt my house. Now we live with nothing. We have nothing left. We live like this now. The attacks are unclaimed and those who carry them out remain largely unidentified. I don't know who they were. It was night. But I can tell you that there were a lot of them. There were young people and women too. Over 300 people have died in these attacks since October 2017. Many of the survivors have since fled, like Ayuba and his family, to seek refuge with relatives who live elsewhere. We live here, not in the house back there. We live here. Six people live in this hut, a family wrenched away from the fields that normally provide their livelihood. I urge the government to do all it can to put a stop to this war so that we can get back to a normal life. Local authorities say they are concerned by the situation and are doing all they can to secure the region. But for the Bishop of Pemba, that is not enough. He recently published a letter criticizing the government for its lack of action and communication. Say who they are, show them, and act to stop the attacks. This is our request, that the authorities go deep because the poor are dying. 
those who have almost nothing are losing the little they have and losing their lives, and we cannot let that happen. The Islamic State group claimed two of the attacks that have taken place in 2019, but police and security experts doubt the veracity of these claims. While authorities have arrested hundreds of suspected attackers, the jihadist phenomenon afflicting northern Mozambique remains steeped in mystery. AFP's Philip Alfroy with that report. South African police patrolled central Johannesburg on Tuesday after the financial capital was hit by a new wave of anti-foreigner violence. Rocks, bricks and rubber bullets were scattered on the empty streets of Alexandra after mobs plundered the township burning and looting shops overnight. Police presence remains heavy and rubber bullets are being fired to break up the crowd, according to media reports. Such violence breaks out sporadically in South Africa, where many nationals blame immigrants for high unemployment, particularly in manual labor jobs. Fighting among rival factions in Libya had ground commerce to a halt at the port of Benghazi, but three years after it reopened, trading is up. Officials say the plan is to raise enough money to fully restore and expand this hub of business. VOA's Arash Arbasadi explains. Business is said to be picking up again in Libya's second largest city, Benghazi, after violence had erupted in 2014. Despite suffering severe losses that reduced the port of Benghazi to a daytime-only operation, commerce is picking up from what a port manager says was a very low point. Infrastructure is zero, or less than zero in the negatives. Yards are unpaved, and there is no lighting at night. This was present before? This was present. We started working on this with revenues, which gradually increase. God willing, one of our main goals is restoring infrastructure. The port suffered much of the same fate as the city of Benghazi when violence broke out five years ago. Rival factions fought for control after fighters were said to have killed Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. The power vacuum resulted in fighting that left parts of the city in ruins. Today, the port of Benghazi is receiving more than 400,000 tons of grain at 18 docks, double the activity prior to 2014. We are also ambitious, hoping we surpass the current numbers. Monthly revenues prior to 2014, according to the port manager, were about $5 million. Management now seeks to top more than $5.5 million in revenue each month. What is different today from years past, he says, is a commitment to investing that money back in the port, creating more opportunity for the 1,400 employees working there. Arash Arbasadi, VOA News, Washington. Africa's use of innovative technology includes drones or unmanned aerial vehicles to quickly get urgently needed blood and medicine to health practitioners. Now Ghana is joining Rwanda in embracing this practice. VOA senior analyst Jeffrey Young explains the operations of drone company Zipline in those two nations. A life-saving blood transfusion is desperately needed. Since 2016 in Rwanda and as of this year in Ghana, these needs can be quickly delivered from the sky. These two African states have leaped over logistical hurdles with unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, built by Zipline, a U.S. technology company. Via Skype, the importance of this advance is explained by Rwanda Ministry of Health spokesman Malik Kayumba. This technology helped our country to deliver these services in a very few minutes between 15 to 45 minutes comparing to four hours that we used to to consider to, to provide that service. Kayumba says Zipline Rwanda has made about 12,000 blood deliveries. Each Zipline UAV can carry 1.7 kilograms of cargo, enough for a liter of blood or supplies such as vaccines or medications. Because the Zipline UAV carries cargo, it is bigger than the drones commonly used by hobbyists. Via Skype, Zipline Rwanda Operations Chief Israel Bimpe. Our UAVs are about uh, two meters long. They have a wingspan of about three meters. Uh, you know, everything weighs about uh, 20 kilograms. 
And so the design is pretty much uh, a modular design. The battery enables the UAV to travel up to 160 kilometers round trip. Most drones are remotely controlled by a person on the ground, but zipline UAVs use self-contained maps for guidance. Again, via Skype, Israel Bimpe. We built predetermined routes, so the regulator has exactly the knowledge of each coordinate of where the route that the UAVs will be taking every time it takes off from our distribution center to a particular health facility. Zipline personnel travel the country to create GPS coordinates for clear flight paths. Via Skype, Zipline Ghana's Daniel Marfo. We try to identify all the um, obstructions, possible obstructions within the area that we are about to, you know, arrive. And um, we've also been uh, supported by other government agencies who have provided us with um, data. After the UAV makes its delivery, it returns to its base. Again, Daniel Marfo. As the UAV is um, approaching the recovery system, it's actually communicating with the recovery system. And they keep adjusting each other, you know, in millimeters till they align perfectly uh, with the snag you know, just under the hook, and then it captures it. When natural disasters strike, such as the two tropical cyclones that battered Mozambique this year, ground infrastructure often gets destroyed. Zipline Rwanda's Bimpe says the company is developing ways for its UAV system to get into damaged areas and emergency supplies into places where ground transportation is nearly impossible. Jeffrey Young, VOA News, Washington. A conservative defection Tuesday shakes up the Brexit battle as MP Philip Lee moves to the Liberal Democrats in a shocking move. It's the latest political maneuver which could prove crucial in Britain's proposed exit from the European Union. As Henry Rijo reports from London, the fight now appears to be not only about Brexit, but about the very fabric of a society and country once seen as one of the world's most stable democracies. London. Manchester. Birmingham, Bristol. Hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets of towns and cities across Britain at the weekend to protest against the government's suspension of Parliament set to take effect in just a week's time. Well, I think it's, it's uh, very, very dangerous for the UK. The demonstrations come ahead of what's likely to be a decisive week for Brexit. On the one side, the government committed to leaving the European Union on October 31st, with or without a deal. It faces a showdown with opponents who believe a no-deal Brexit would be a disaster. A group of MPs from all parties, probably, including senior Conservatives, are going to try to get together to take control of the business of the House of Commons, then to pass legislation which would have to go through the Commons and the Lords to rule out a no-deal Brexit. But they face huge challenges. So they've got to keep this new coalition together, a very odd coalition, with people on the far left on the Labour leadership and some people on the centre-right of the Conservative Party. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says blocking no deal would play into the hands of the European Union. If they think Brexit can be blocked anyway, they're not going to give us the deal we need. And so uh, my anxiety is that stuff going on in Parliament can actually undermine the UK's negotiating position. But we're going to get on and do it. Johnson has threatened any of his Conservative MPs voting to block a no-deal Brexit with deselection at the next election, something that could happen very soon if the opposition tables a vote of no confidence in the government. It would only take a couple of Conservative MPs to make that decision to bring down the government, but it really would be quite unprecedented for Conservative MPs to vote against their own government. Meanwhile, several court cases have been launched against the government to try to block the suspension of Parliament, with rulings also due this week. That threatens to drag Queen Elizabeth into the Brexit battleground, as it's she, as official head of state, who gave permission for the prorogation of Parliament. From Buckingham Palace to the courts to Westminster, Britain's democracy is being tested to breaking point.
The next five days will be crucial in deciding who will emerge victorious in this explosive Brexit battle. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. I am Sheikha Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We'll pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent um, to most know, people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic. It is the beat, the African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the Voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com/africanbeat. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. The only thing being mass-produced at this factory are selfies, lots of them. The Instagrammable Selfie Factory is a quirky pop-up that's running for six weeks at London's Westfield Shopping Center. It was inspired by photo-friendly locations in the United States. Visitors paid $12 for an hour's visit. The location even has over 20 rooms for costume changes. The location's hashtag has been used over 1,000 times on Instagram. Next up, a group of children disturbed by the number of people that get lost in Australia's Northern Territory every year are taking matters into their own hands. They're using new technology to share well-established bush survival tips and now they're ready to release their invention to the world. It's the Tourist Information NT app, or TINT for short. One function of the app is a water calculator. The user enters variables, such as age, weight, and gender, and the app calculates the total amount of water needed for the journey. And finally, far from causing harm to themselves, Elderly people can benefit from vigorous resistance exercise as long as they're healthy. A new study from the University of Birmingham claims there can be significant improvements in muscle mass, even in old age, with resistance exercise, and even among people who have led sedentary lifestyles. People who have known illnesses should consult doctors before taking strenuous exercise. And that's what's trending today. Residents in the Bahamas experienced another awful night as the center of powerful Hurricane Dorian hovered over the northern edge of Grand Bahama Island. Prime Minister Hubert Minnis has confirmed that at least five people have died. VOA's Michael Brown reports. Hurricane Dorian stalled over the Grand Bahamas Island, pounding it with fierce winds and massive rainfall. Authorities say at least five people died on the Bahamas' Abaco Island. People were urged to stay indoors although the storm may be in its final hours of hovering over the Bahamas. We want to say to the citizens here in Abaco who are in the impacted area, it is not safe to go outdoors. Power lines are down, uh, lamp poles are down, trees are across the street. It is very dangerous to be outdoors if you don't have to be outdoors. As soon as the weather permits, our first responders will go to those areas where we had reports from individuals who were in distress. We have already organized our parties to move as soon as it is safe for them to do so. Dorian's impact in the Bahamas was caught on camera as ABC's Marcus Moore and his team spotted four people yelling for help, urging them to swim to their location so they could huddle in a shelter while the backside of the hurricane moved over the island. Forecasters predict Dorian will remain a Category 4 hurricane as it drifts dangerously close to the east coast of Florida late Tuesday and the Georgia and South Carolina coasts Wednesday and Thursday. Millions of residents from Florida to South Carolina have been ordered to evacuate. North Carolina is under a state of emergency 
with Dorian expected to make landfall there early Wednesday. Because this storm is anticipated to pick up speed, time is running out to get ready. Even if Dorian does not make landfall on the Atlantic coast, towns and cities still can expect up to 25 centimeters of rain, life-threatening flash floods, and some tornadoes. Forecasters predict Dorian will remain a hurricane as it moves up the Atlantic seaboard this week. Michael Brown, VOA News. Zimbabwe's public sector doctors are striking Tuesday as they demand a further pay hike of a whopping 401% that they want linked to the U.S. dollar. This latest demand comes despite earlier accepting a 60% raise from President Emerson Mnangagwa's government. Zimbabwe is currently suffering its worst economic crisis in a decade with a triple-digit inflation, rolling power cut and shortages of fuel and bread. It's time for our health report and joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu with an update on Congo's Ebola. Lino? That's right, uh, Esther. Uh, the United Nations uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres is encouraging donors to honor the pledges to fight Ebola. The UN chief made the appeal Monday, one day after visiting an Ebola treatment center in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where he offered support in fighting the outbreak. First of all, with Ebola, we must acknowledge that the donor country pledges correspond, more or less, until the end of the year, to our needs. We must turn commitments into effective payments. So far, we have only received 15 percent of what we need until the end of the year. Now, a week's delay during a normal humanitarian operation is not a problem. We can adapt the program to resolve that issue. But in the case of Ebola, a week without resources, a week without a response, it doesn't mean we lose a week. It can mean we lose the war against Ebola. Because things can get out of control immediately. So I have called for the donor countries to quickly make the payments they have committed to. The current Ebola outbreak has killed more than 2,000 people and infected 1,000 others. Meanwhile, a low years for Congo's former health minister, Oli Ngulunga, say police questioned him over his management of funds to fight the Ebola epidemic. Ilunga resigned in July after overseeing the government's response to the Ebola outbreak for nearly one year. He denies any wrongdoing. New research warns that malaria infection is linked to a 30% higher risk of heart failure. The researchers used Danish nationwide registries to identify patients with a history of malaria infection between January 1994 and January 2017. Around 4,000 malaria cases were identified. Patients in the 11-year follow-up study were, on average, aged 34 and 58% of the subjects were male. Researchers say patients had a 30% increased likelihood of developing heart failure over the follow-up time. They note that while heart failure risk was increased for patients in the small study, there was not a link to heart attack or cardiovascular death. More research is needed to further validate the findings. The research was presented at the ESC Congress 2019 together with the World Congress of Cardiology in Paris. The World Health Organization says there is a need to rethink approaches in tackling malaria if the world is to meet the 2030 target of reducing malaria case incidence and mortality rate by 90%. The World Health Organization says accelerated research and development in new tools for malaria prevention and treatment is key if the world is to eradicate malaria in the foreseeable future. In addition, there is an urgent need for progress to advance universal health coverage and improve access to services. The findings are part of a report from WHO's Strategic Advisory Group on Malaria Eradication. Pedro Alonso is the WHO Global Malaria Program Director. Malaria eradication is a hard, uh, a highly ambitious, but a highly desirable public health goal. It will not be achieved unless we can secure three key elements. The first one is that we need to have real political leadership and commitment that translates into the financing that is required to ensure universal health coverage for all the population at risk. 
without UHC, without adequate healthcare, people-centered, properly financed systems, we will not achieve eradication. The WHO says more than 210 million people are infected by malaria every year and about 400,000 die of the mosquito-borne disease. Over 90% of the world's malaria deaths occur in sub-Saharan Africa. Global malaria infection and death rates have remained virtually unchanged since 2015. The WHO's World Malaria Report in 2018 reveals that the world is currently off track to achieve the 2030 goals in reducing malaria case incidence and mortality rate by 90%. The second thing we need to have in place is a more strategic, better use of data. Surveillance systems that allow us to respond in a timely and efficient way to where the problem is. And the third thing we need is new tools. With the tools we have today, the tools meaning the vector control mechanisms or tools to fight the vector, the mosquito that transmits malaria, with the type of drugs that we have today, with the type of vaccines that we have today, we can go very far. The WHO's Strategic Advisory Group on Malaria Eradication notes there is a need to rethink approaches in tackling malaria. Last November, the International Health Body and the Rollback Malaria Partnership launched the High Burden to High Impact approach. This aims to jumpstart progress against malaria by targeting attention to the 11 countries with 70% of the world's malaria burden, thus 10 African countries and India. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Mudu. Esther? Now, Lenore, there has been some progress in uh, preventing malaria, but we've heard of vaccines. We're not quite sure we're there yet. Yes, so the, the thing with malaria, it's, it's a bit complex because we've seen over the years some progress made with countries like Rwanda, Zanzibar, the, the, the Zanzibar island that have made some quite, quite a lot of progress. But yet, uh, according to figures, the progress has stalled. So what experts are saying is that more innovation is needed. We've seen that the vaccine, the RTSS, is being used in a couple of countries. So that gives hopes that, uh, you know, malaria can be prevented in addition to uh, what we have already, which is uh, mosquito bed nets, treated yeah. bed nets. So, yes, uh, we're looking forward to the next few years. Thanks, Lino. Be sure to watch Lino Mudu's health reports every Tuesday on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.